My notes aren't in there, so it's okay. We're going to go to the book of 3 John. We're going to go all the way down to verse 5 when we're going to get started. There will be a bang here in just a second because verse 4 was boom. Point number 1. Grace, mercy, and peace are the truths. So we saw here in the book of 2 John that grace, mercy, and peace were something that were given to us by God. And then he, he's emphatic about this in the next letter, and, and he's emphatic about it. He's talking to the same people. It's coming from the same person that we understand that grace, mercy, and peace are truths of God provided to us by God. So when we get all the way down to verse 5, beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers. I'm going to be here for the rest of the night. <laughs> Verse 5 in the book of 3 John, if you've never read the book of 3 John before, verse 5 actually calls us to be faithful to whom? To our brethren and to strangers. I, I saw something the other day that strangers are just friends you haven't met yet. Scripture actually says that in some instances when you entertain strangers, you're actually entertaining angels. So what we have here is we have a commandment by God telling us that grace, peace, and mercy are are our fruits that God has blessed us with, and he asks us to be faithful with those three things to whomever we deal with. That is the people that you like in your family. That is the people you like at work. That is the people you like in your community. And it's the people that you despise. Come on, yeah. We're supposed to be faithful in our interactions with everybody because we call ourselves Christians. We're not supposed to represent what the world represents. We're supposed to represent what Christ says we're supposed to represent. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers. We're not like that. We're not. I'm not trying to pick on anybody, and I'm not, I'm not trying to say this church does a bad job of that. I'm saying that instinctively, we protect our own. Instinctively, we protect our own from people that we don't know that are children of God. Why should we protect our own from children of God? We should be as faithful to the strangers as we are to our own so that the children of God here on this place can complete the work of God wherever he sends us to. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done. First Baptist Granite, Arkansas. It has some work that it needs to get done. It's lacking in faithful people in order to carry out that tasks. Those tasks. So God has provided in his great joy to send them a young man who is in seminary who was willing enough to share that with us and all he asked us for was prayer so he could be successful in his efforts. He didn't say, hey, I'm taking a carload of people up there. Who wants to come with me? He didn't say, hey, you know what? When I get there, I'm going to need some food and I'm going to need some place to stay and I'm going to need some gas money for my car. So if you have some money, would you send it with me? No, he just said, I'm going to go what God has called to, to tell me to do and, and I'm going to do it faithfully. So here we are in the book of 3 John, chapter 5, sorry, chapter 1, verse 5. He's going to be faithful to strangers that he doesn't know for the greater glory of God. Now, I'm not trying to make you feel good about yourself because you can get up there and mess it all up. You could. Especially if we don't pray for you. So it's going to be really incumbent for us during this particular week that he's asked for prayer that we remember from June 10th through the 15th, Brother Jared is going to be on the mission field in Arkansas. Have you guys ever been to Arkansas? It's a mission field. There are lost people everywhere. It's almost as bad as Cass County. That was a joke, but you guys can laugh. It's okay. There are lost people here, too. Verse 6. Who have borne witness of your love before the church, if you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. Golly, it's almost like God wrote this so we would know what we're supposed to do if somebody was going on the mission field. Amen. Just in case you weren't paying attention, verse 6 says, Who have borne witness of your love before the church. Has Jared done that? Yes. I think that he has. 
If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. Is he going on a journey? Yeah. Are we going to do our part so that he does well? Yeah. We have to. We have to. So at this point, some of you should start getting nervous. What is it that we actually have to do? Let's read verse 7. Because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. Okay, so now this is not necessarily going to be exactly the same scenario, but it plays out. It does. Jared, what are you planning to take with you when you go to First Baptist Greenwich? I can't read my own handwriting. What are you planning to take with you? Clothes in the Bible. Because they went forth with his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. Now this is really, this is one of those moments where as a preacher I get super excited. I, and you thought I was already, but no, I'm super excited. Because listen to what God is saying here. We, the church, are responsible for delivering the word of God to the Gentiles. We, the church, are responsible for delivering the word of God to the Gentiles and asking nothing from them other than they accept the grace of God, the atoning work of God on the cross for their sins. We're not, we're not going out to the lost and saying, you know what, I'm going to have a bake sale and we're going to try and raise money because we want to build a new and bigger sanctuary. We want to put in a balcony so we can have two floors. We're not supposed to go out into the world and say, you know what, we're trying to do these great things for the glory of God and we want you to help fund us. We're not supposed to do that because God is supposed to be the one who provides for us. And if he's providing for us, what need do we have to ask of anything else? Now you're quiet. You're wondering how far I'm going with this, right? Because they went forth for his name's sake, for the name of Jesus, and asked nothing in return. That's why two years ago when we were hosting food events, we didn't ask for any money. The church provided everything that we needed, and we took it out in the community, and we shared with them the grace and glory of God, and we fed the people, and we told them, Jesus loves you. We had a band out back. We had an antique car show. We had a bounce house. We gave away cotton candy and snow cones. And we told people that Jesus loved them. Yeah. We were following the, the, the confines of the word of God and carrying out the message of God to the lost and asking nothing in return. The church is responsible for doing that. The church was created to reach and save the lost, ladies and gentlemen. It was not created. It was never created so we could be comfortable in our salvation. It, it wasn't created so that when we can come in here and we can sit down and go, Woo, I'm glad I'm not out there. We're supposed to be so brokenhearted for those people out there that when we're sitting in here, we come to the point of tears because we want to be able to reach those people because we know that if they don't accept Christ, they're dying and going to hell. And that's not a comfortable place. It's either verse 8 or point 2. I don't remember. Ah, verse 8. We therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. It's written in Scripture that we're supposed to be concerned for the lost. We're supposed to be reaching the Gentiles. We're not supposed to be asking anything in return. We're just supposed to get up and go and do it. So that what? So that we may become fellow workers for the truth. Well, what do I want to be? I don't want to be the pastor of a dead church. I want to be brokenhearted for the lost. You guys are all okay. I'm pretty secure in your salvation because you can share with me your story. And I know that when you come time to stand before God, you will be able to say, I'm a terrible, awful, wretched sinner, but I called on Jesus. And you're going to be great. God has a place for you built in heaven forever and ever and ever. But those people who are outside these walls that aren't in this meeting right now, who would rather be someplace else than in the house of God, those people are lost and dying and going to hell. And we have to figure out how we're going to reach them. Because <laughs> that's 
what scripture says we're supposed to do. It's not just that crazy preacher you brought in. It's what the word of God says you're supposed to do. Okay, Krista, can you take me to the next one? Because I keep pushing the button and it's not going. Point two. I like it just as much when she does it as when I do it. Point number two, you got to look at those verses ahead and notice that he said if and ought. You, you, you got to see that what he's talking about here, he says, if we do what we ought to do, then we will be fellow workers of the truth. If we don't do what we ought to do, what does that leave us? It, it, it leaves us in a position of hypocrisy, ladies and gentlemen. If we can read the word of God and say, well, he was really talking to somebody else, not necessarily to me, then we become hypocrites instead of Christians. If we do what we ought to do, then the word of God does not return void. If we do not do what we ought to do, then we are the problem. Amen. I say we. Because I promise you, when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to die trying. I am. I'm going to try and be here for SOS in the morning. I'm going to try. Because I want to do what I ought to do. I want to make a difference in this place for time and eternity for some poor soul that is on the fast track to hell. And you don't have to go that far to find them. You can read their names on our prayer list. You have family members that you aren't sure about their salvation. You can ask them. You, you have friends that you're not sure about their salvation. You can ask them. You can share with them the truth of God. You can share with them the greater glory of God. And you're not asking them to do anything in return. Bring them to church and I'll ask them. I will. I'll ask them to get out of the chair, walk down to the front row, and make a commitment in front of all of you that they're going to serve God to the best of their ability. I will. And, and, and I will ask them if they've never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, if they're willing to do that and if they're willing to follow through with believers in baptism, because that's what Scripture says we're supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to do, so that's the business that we're in. And, and I know some people get upset when I say it's a business, but ladies and gentlemen, there's work that needs to be done. And there's a few of us that are willing to do it. And God receives the glory. And it's what scripture tells us we're supposed to do. Verse 9. I'm getting close. Five minutes. I wrote to the churches. Chris, do you want to pronounce that for me? Diotrophies? Diotrophies? Okay, so she's as lost as I am. Thank you, Krista. So I wrote to the church. And this one guy who loves to have preeminence among them does not receive us. I'm, I'm, I'm not even trying to pronounce it. I wrote to the church, but some hypocrite who loves to have preeminence among them does not receive us. I wrote to the church and said, this is what we're supposed to do. But there was somebody in the church that says, nah, we're not doing that. He could have wrote that about 90% of the churches in America today. And I don't want to be one of them. I want us to be concerned. With doing what we ought to do. Amen. Verse 10. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does. Prating against us with malicious words. I love this. Book of 3 John, he says... I wrote to the church, but that one guy, that hypocrite, he didn't want anything to do with us. So I want to let you know, if I get there and he's still there, I've got a few words I'm going to say about that. I love that because that gives the church an opportunity to take care of the problem. 
Ladies and gentlemen, you have an opportunity to take care of the problem. You do. Scripture actually says if you have a problem with someone inside the church, you go to that person in private and say, hey, I have a particular problem and I would like to work through it so we can get together and we can bring glory to God. And then if that doesn't help, then you're supposed to bring back a witness and you're supposed to say, hey, I have a problem and I brought a witness because he has a problem. And our problem is that you're not doing what you ought to do because the word of God is very clear about what it is we're supposed to do and we ain't doing it. And then the scripture says, if that person agrees, then you have won a brother. And then the scripture says, if that person does not agree, you kick them out. Kaboom. <laughs> the church is not supposed to be a place filled with hypocrites. It's supposed to be a place filled with people who are doing what we ought to do. It's a wonderful church to be part of. Continuing in verse 10. And not contend with that. He himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. This hypocrite is taking the position that, that he's not going to do it because he doesn't want to. And if you guys think that you're going to do anything about it, he's going to put you outside of the church. The church of God, the church that belongs, the church that Jesus Christ died for, the church that is supposed to be on fire for the work of God is going to allow someone to say, no, we're not going to do the work of God. I don't think so. We're not going to allow somebody to stand between us and the work that God has created for us. And if we do, then we're not doing what we ought to do. Verse 11. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God. But he who does evil has not seen God. Verse 12. That hypocrite. Nope, different guy. I'm sorry. Demetrius now. I'm not talking about the hypocrite anymore. Take that back. Edit that out if you can, Brandon. Don't make me look like I made a mistake. Watch, I'm going to read it again just so we can edit it out. Okay, verse 12. Demetrius has a good testimony from all. And from the truth itself. And we also bear witness. And you know that our testimony is true. Continuing in verse 13. I had many things to write. But I do not wish to write you with pen and ink. I hate that part. You know what that means? That means that there was a problem that the church was having in the first century that John was just fixing to give them the solution for. And instead of giving them the solution for it, he says, I'll tell you when I get there. That means that we missed out on learning how to solve a problem because John wanted to wait until he got there. Now, I'm not saying John had the ability to overwrite the Holy Spirit here, so I want you to understand that if God needed us to know this information, then he would have given this information to us. But I also want you to understand, I think I know why he didn't write it in there, because he wrote so many other things in here we pay no attention to. What's one more thing? Think about that for a second. He didn't even take the time to tell us, because he knew we weren't paying attention anyway. How do we correct that? Let's take the things that he did write down very serious. Let's take the things that he did write down so serious that it controls the way that we live our lives so that the way that we live our lives will bring greater and greater glory to God. Because the rest of the lost and dying world, ladies and gentlemen, needs to see that our God is still alive because they are out there and they don't believe he is. And it's completely our fault because we have the ability. We have the power. We have the information. We have the experience. We're just not necessarily putting it to work. Verse 14. But I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. Peace to you, our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. We started off in the book of 3 John. Grace, mercy, and peace. We end the book of 3 John with peace. But ladies and gentlemen, I think it only ends with peace because he believes 
that they are going to do what they ought to do. Because that's where you find peace in your heart when you are living in conjunction with the Word of God. And I promise you, you will not find peace living in any other way. Point number three. Do the work. Do the work. Not the work of the devil. Remember, we're not supposed to imitate what is evil, but what is good. Do the work of God every day. The stuff that we know we ought to do. And if we do what we ought to do, then we will find peace in the position of godliness. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, dear Lord, for a sermon in the middle of the week. Thank you, dear Lord, for words of wisdom you wrote in Scripture thousands of years ago so we could put them into practice today. Thank you, dear Lord, for giving us an opportunity to reach out in this community and help another church, dear Lord, who might not be doing as well as we are. But we pray, dear God, for the hands and feet of this congregation to do our part for your continued glory. Amen.